our beliefs will give us direction for life. There's a lot of people that believe a lot of things. But if it doesn't move them to action, then their beliefs are quite, kind of shallow. So as Christians, when we say that we believe and, and we say these things, it moves us to action. It moves us beyond just the words. It causes us to do things, uh, maybe even out of our comfort zone. Uh, I forgot to announce earlier there's supposed to be a meeting after the, after the service. Uh, and I know that maybe there's even things that you guys have been doing that's maybe even out of your comfort zone. Uh, for the service of someone else in the family of God. Uh, and and it's, that's where our belief systems really engage in how we live a legacy. I mean, every single one of us are going to come to the point in our life that we're going to breathe our last. And it's not something we want to think about. And it's not something that, that just sits there and hones on our mind every single day. But it's a reality. So in that, I... I look at it, and, and one of the things that we have to, to think about as a, as a preacher, when I do a funeral, one of the things that we will talk about is what legacy are they le leaving? But I want us to look at it from the vantage point of what legacy are you living right now? Because what you do matters. How you live out your life matters. And, and last week we talked about the idea of character and integrity and with character and, and integrity, those are more of an internal thing that goes on. It's something on the inside of who we are. It's, it's mainly determined by our thoughts. How I think determines what I do. So what you do is all determined by what you think. And when we don't take captive our thoughts... Our actions, well, I tell you what, I'm getting a lot of feedback in. I mean, let me take that little cord right there out. I'm going to lay it right there like that. I think that thing's not getting it. Either that or the New England Patriots are too close to the front. <laughs> but my thoughts, they matter. And, and think about it. In the, in the sense of how you go about your normal day, whether you're in a good mood or a bad mood, is determined about what you are thinking about, what it goes over your mind over and over and over. How you determine someone else's worth is what you think about them. And those thoughts that keep running over your mind determine what you say about them, how you act towards them, how you live out your everyday life. For some of you, your thoughts of disgruntledness to an individual has gotten to the place in your life that you've become so bitter that you can now say they have full control over your thoughts even though they're not even trying. I mean, the reality is, is a lot of times you give people control of your thoughts and they don't even know it. They don't even know you're upset. They don't even, some of them do know that you're upset and they don't care. And yet you still give them that control in your mind. See, the Bible tells us a couple of things from last week. Guard your heart above all else. For it determines the course of your life, that inner being, that will, your intention, what you do with your life, guard it because it matters. The Bible also says, don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Man, I don't know about you, but that's pretty difficult as the saying goes. It's tough to teach an old dog old tricks, right? Uh, yeah, new tricks. Yeah, I mean, if the old dog didn't learn any tricks in the first place, it's even tougher to teach them tricks at this point because they'll look at you and go, I don't care now. You've been feeding me this long without me doing stuff. I'm going to keep getting fed whether or not I do it or not. That could be a cat, though, couldn't it? I don't know. It reads, then you will know. Then you will learn.
to know. See, we don't always know God's will for our life and what I think and how I think. And when I change my thinking patterns of what I think about, what I put into this body, what I put into my mind. It will teach me what it is that God's will for my life is. And as I learn and I grow and I expand upon this, I will see that his will is good and perfect and pleasing. See, my thoughts matter. The Bible tells us this morning to fix your thoughts. To fix your thoughts on what is true, what is honorable, what is right and pure. What is lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. For us, as we look and we think about that character and that integrity on the inside, I want us to move on to living a legacy and think about virtue or power. And in the New Testament, the, the word power uh, that I will be talking about comes from a Greek word, and I don't talk too much about all the Greek stuff, but I think it's important. It's dynamis. And this dynamis, this power, it's kind of like where we get the word dynamite. You know, it can be very explosive and be very bad, or it can open up avenues for you to be able to travel through it. It's, it's in how the power is used that determines whether it's good or bad. And in this power, we also see that, that there is something called virtue. This virtue and power go hand in hand. That when we think about virtue and power, it's not something that's just internal. It is now something that has come out of me. So what comes out of me, this power, this, this virtue matters. See, the Bible tells us in Mark chapter 5, looking at verse 24. Jesus went with him and all the people followed, crowding around him. A woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. She had suffered a great deal from many doctors and over the years she had spent everything she had to pay them. But she had gotten no better. In fact, she had gotten worse. She had heard about Jesus, so she came up behind him through the crowd and touched his robe. <clears throat> For she thought to herself, if I could just touch his robe, I would be healed. Now, I want you to envision this crowd of people. I want you to imagine us all getting in the hallway out there, all of us at the same time. And Mitchell comes walking through the crowd of people. And there's somebody there that says, I must just touch his robe. And if I touch his robe, everything's going to be okay. So this crowd is there and everything's going through. And in verse 29, it says, immediately the bleeding stopped. She could feel her body that she had been healed of her terrible condition. Jesus realized at once that healing power, virtue, had gone out from him. So he turned around to the crowd and asked, who touched my robe? What? I mean, can you imagine him walking down and us all in that hallway and going, who touched me? I mean, you would kind of look around going, what do you mean? Who touched you? It's a crowd of people. There's a lot of people in this hallway here. It's pretty tough for somebody not to touch everybody. You touched a lot of people. What are you talking about? And his disciples said to him, look at this crowd pressing around you. How can you ask who touched me? But he kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the frightened woman, trembling at the realization of what had happened to her, came and fell to her knees in front of him and told him what she had done. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. All these people.
people coming around Jesus, this entire crowd bumping, touching, nothing changing, nothing happening. Everything's just like any other day. My feet touch his feet. My elbow comes against his arm. I, I come through and our knees knock against each other. No difference. Nothing changes. And yet this one woman touches Jesus and he stops and says, who touched me? And it made all the difference in the world to this woman. It changed her life. See, this virtue, this power that, that went out of Jesus is not just about character and integrity, which Jesus has the utmost of them both. But this power came through. I asked this question this morning. What comes out of you when you are bumped? I mean, think about it. I, I look at a slick road and I know it's summertime and getting ready to turn fall. So now we're in this crazy weather time and, and you go, well, it's not wintertime. But what happens when you hit a bump on the road and it's icy? What happens when something kind of knocks into you a little bit? What happens? What happens when you get up in the morning on the wrong side of the bed and somebody bumps into you? You know, the proverbial bump. It could be a real bump. It could be just a, hey, how are you doing? And oh, I just said hi. And you go, man, what is going on up in here? And what happens is we don't see the power we have with our words and our actions. And the virtue of that is something that comes out every single moment of your life that people are around you. In a, in a, in a sense, we're kind of like these fruit trees. You know what a fruit tree is, right? Now, I'm not calling us a bunch of fruits. I'm just saying we're a fruit tree, right? And, and the fruit that comes off that tree, people take a bite of that fruit, do they not? And every time they get around you, they determine, are you good fruit or bad fruit? You ever get around a tree and you see it? I mean, I grew up on a farm and, and there were apple trees and it didn't take me long to look up into the apple tree and realize which apples I didn't want to get. I mean, do you know what's worse than finding a worm in your apple? Y'all have done it, haven't you? <laughs> to get an apple and it's all bruised and it's soft and you bite into it and you just kind of, you just want to, you know what I'm saying, right? Yeah, I'm out on the farm, I'm outside, I just spit it out right there, I don't care. But you get to the place in your life that you start looking up because it, the tree was big and you had this long thing that you had, had these little claws and you'd reach up and you would just fill this little basket up with apples. And I mean, we had hundreds of apples. It didn't take long to start seeing, oh, not that apple, not that apple, not that. Apple. And you start chucking the apples because you're like, I don't want to. Do you ever have somebody in your life that when they start walking up, you go, ooh, don't, don't start a conversation with them. Don't, because when you start, oh, you, <laughs> it hurts so much to have a conversation with that person. You ever have somebody like that? Maybe if you don't, maybe you're the person that the person next to you is thinking about. <laughs> but you get the thing. Jesus had power. He had virtue. And when this person came by and touched him, this power went through and it changed this person's life. See, for us, this virtue and one of the greatest ones we have is to love one another. You ever come in and try to do something nice for someone and they remain ungrateful as if they're old? You ever do something for someone and after you get through, you're like, man, why did I ever try to do something nice for them? And you have to remember, it's not about what they're giving you. It's about what you are giving them. See, the Bible tells us this. In Romans chapter one, 
Verse 15. So I am eager to come to you in Rome, Paul writes, to preach the good news. For I am not ashamed of the good news about Christ, the gospel. It is the power. I want you to hold on to that word power. It's the virtue. It is the dynamis of what we are all about. It is the very thing that flows through us and out of us. When we accept Jesus Christ into our life, it's not a, a, a well that fills up and it just hangs in. It is a spring of living water that comes in and it flows through us. And as it flows through what God gives us, we can't help but to give to others. And he is saying, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes the Jews first and also the Gentile. This good news, the gospel, tells us how God makes us right in his sight. This is accomplished from start to finish by faith. You remember the lady who touched Jesus? Jesus said, your faith has healed you. See, in our life, when we look and we understand the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, there is power that comes with the good news. We understand that there's bad news in this world. We understand that the circumstances of life are not going to always be good. We understand that people are not going to always be nice. But it's not about those things. See, the real power of how we live and how we are motivated comes through the good news of Jesus Christ. We, it, it is impossible for you to accept the good news of Jesus Christ and, and walk around with a frown on your face. And if you're sitting there going, oh no, preacher, you ought to see me every day. I got a frown on my face, even though, then you don't understand the power of the good news. And in this very moment, as we continue on, and I show you a couple of more verses, I want you to grapple with the idea of changing your thought process of what you focus upon every day and what takes control of your life. What are you giving power to? Or who are you giving power to? See, the Bible tells us it is through faith that a righteous person has life. See, what comes out of you when you are bumped? Bumped by life. Bumped by circumstances. Bumped by someone who gets up in your face. Bumped. See, what we do is determined by our thoughts. And who I am as a human being, who I am as a, as a, as a child of God, is determined by the good news of what Jesus Christ did. He gave us good news. And how is it that I'm going to love one another? It's not because I am love. It's because I am loved. It's not because of my love. It's because of His love working through me. See, if it's all determined about my love, well, my love is always determined about how you make me feel, how, you, how you're doing right now, how you're behaving. Have you ever lashed out at someone and said, well, if you wouldn't have done this, I wouldn't have done that? Why do we give people that kind of control over our life? See, the power of the good news is when we get bumped we don't allow people to take things out from us that should never be in with us within us in the first place. The Bible says this in 2 Timothy. You should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be difficult times. Can anybody give me a woo-hoo that there's difficult times? It ain't getting no easier. I don't care if Apple is coming out with a new iOS 12. Though I'm looking forward to it. You know what I'm saying. <laughs> For people will love only themselves and their money. 
They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents. I mean, when I was a kid, I got in trouble at school. My mom and dad didn't go to the teachers and fuss at them. And they said he went to the teachers and made sure that I got in trouble there and said when I got home, I was going to be in trouble there too. Now, nobody gets in trouble for nothing. And we look at it and we say, where is the respect in life? God's word is telling us very clearly. And what we put into our hearts and what we put into our minds, it determines our actions to where all of a sudden nobody has respect for anybody and they become ungrateful. Oh man, I remember, I, I think it's just about been every one of my children when they were younger, they would get a gift, you know, at Christmas time or birthday. And, and I think most parents have probably gone through this to where they, they come in and go, <laughs> I already got one of these. <laughs> I'm not sure that's how they did it. That's just how I perceived it. And I'm like, uh, you said, hey, I'm going to have one of these one more time. You won't be getting none of nothing no more. You are to be grateful. It's something that we teach. It moves on and we move forward and we understand this. But the Bible tells us very clear that people will become disobedient to their parents. They're going to become ungrateful. We look around the world today and what do we see? They will consider nothing sacred. For the younger generation, they know not of businesses being closed on Sundays. And many of you here remember it. Why? Because they didn't want to get money? No, because they knew this day was sacred. They knew what God was all about and they knew that they were to set apart a day to rest and to worship and to be a part of him. And now we get to the place to where nothing is sacred. Do we see that in our world today? Paul goes on telling Timothy. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. Do we see that? In the very world we live in. And for those who are not on social media. There are aspects of social media that are gross. When you see someone post something and then the comments of slander and hatred that comes out of people's mouths and they go, well, I would say it to the face, so it's okay. No, you're just mean. It's not, oh, I'm just an honest person. No, you're mean. Everything that's going on in the world today, God's word is telling us it's coming. And we see this and we understand this and we grapple with it. For they will be cruel and hate what is good. Think about all the lawsuits we see in this day and age. 25, 30 years ago would have not even been a thought. And yet today it's becoming big time. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride and love pleasure rather than God. It's the world we live in. So what are we at task to do? We're at task to do this. When we look and see there will be people who act religious, but they will reject the power of that could make them godly. The Bible tells us to stay away from people like that. Now I know there's a lot of people in the world who want to cut those verses out. There's a lot of people who want to take that out. And the reality is, is one of the biggest downfalls in Christianity are people who claim to be Christian and then go out and live a lifestyle and a life that is contrary to God's holy word. So in our life, if we don't allow God's holy word, his power of the gospel of Jesus Christ to come in and transform, 
transform my life, to change the way I think about how life is and what it means, then this power will never do anything to change me. There was a man, I think his name was Colonel Plum. And, and he tells a story of when he was in the military. I, I can't, you'd have to look it up. But he talked about when, when Pearl Harbor happened. Most, most of you know about Pearl Harbor, right? And he says, I remember getting on that boat. And he says, as I got on the boat, as the sirens were siring off, he said, I remember that Wednesday night I had went to church. And for that Bible study, they said, here's what we're going to do for our Bible study. Everybody's going to tell your favorite Bible verse. You're going to quote it and you're going to tell us why that's your favorite Bible verse. And he says, I was towards the back and he says, I went into panic mode. I'd been going to church all my life. And yet I didn't know a favorite Bible verse. And he finally, when it got close to me, I realized, and I thought, John 3, 16, that's the one. And he said, the person right next to me did John 3, 16. He said, then that day came that I remember getting on that boat. And he says, we weren't ready for war at that time. And he says, on the boat I was on, all we had were blanks. And he says, as the Japanese planes were flying over, here I was, we were shooting these planes, but there was nothing coming out but blanks. And he said, I remember crashing down to the side of the wall there and saying to myself and saying to the Lord, Lord, this is my life. I've been going to church. I've been doing these things. I've been saying this stuff, but really it's hollow. It's shallow. It's not there. It's been fake. There's no power in it. I've been living a lie. And he says, Lord, if you get me through this, I promise you, I will change my life. It's an interesting story. Because see, for some of us, maybe not sitting here, maybe listening to it on video. Maybe as you walk around and you see the, you hear people. They bring up prayer. Then you see the rest of their life and you're like. Why do you talk about prayer when the rest of your life doesn't do anything for the glory of God? See, there's no power in it. There's no way that I'm going to find that joy that we sing about. There's no way I'm going to find that faith. There's no way I'm going to, when I get bumped into, love's just going to come flowing out of me. There's no way I'm going to love one another because in my heart I feel like that everything is for me. I've become selfish. I've become self-centered. I've become it's about me, my, I, I want, I want, I want. And it doesn't really matter what everybody else, and if they're not doing something that pleases me, then I'm just going to throw my hands up and forget everybody. See, in our life today, Paul understood this and he told Timothy that. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, two chapters before that, Paul said, This is why I remind you, Timothy, to fan into flames the spiritual gift God gave you when I laid my hands on you. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity but of power, virtue that comes out of me. Love that's not just in me, it flows through me. And self-discipline, self-control, that thing that says when someone bumps up against you and he says, fan into flame this, so never be ashamed to tell others about our Lord. See, in our life, the greatest power that comes in and through us is to love one another. And in that loving one another, it changes how I see people. It changes when people bump into me, my reaction. And I don't give them control of my life for me to do things that are quote unquote dumb because they did it. It's about the love of God. See, for you today... Here's the hope. 
That as we look and we understand and we grapple with the idea of the love of God, what comes out of you when you're bummed? Not when things are going great. When things are going great, everybody can be happy. When things are going great, everybody can talk well. But when things are not going so great, what comes out of you? Paul told Timothy, and I tell us today, if you find your joy waning, if you find bitterness brewing, if you find unforgiveness a part of your life, then fan into flames that gift that God has given you, that gift of the good news of Jesus Christ, because I'm here to tell you there is nothing more powerful than the love of Jesus Christ in and through our life. And it doesn't matter what this world throws your way. I again repeat it. It doesn't matter what this world throws my way. It will never have control of the joy and the love and the peace that we have that comes through Jesus Christ. So when it bumps up against you, don't lash out. Give the power and the virtue of the love of God flowing through you. When people speak evil of you, they will be put to shame, not by you, but by the Lord Jesus Christ. And one day we'll all get to see Jesus Christ face to face. And we'll give an account for every word and every deed and every action that we have done. And this is my prayer for you, the same prayer that Paul gave to the church in Ephesus. And I'm going to ask you guys to stand as we go to the Lord in prayer. And you guys come to, to sing this morning. Lord, I ask that you would help each one of us to fan into flames that virtue, that power. And when someone comes along, they're needing a healing touch from Jesus. And Lord, sometimes that's us. For Lord, you work through people. So as the world bumps up around us, help us to always see and to give love. Lord, even the other day I was in a place and I didn't recognize the couple. I, I didn't know who they were. And they had seen that I had signed my name on something, Lord, and they came to me. They said, I'm praying for your daughter. And they told me who they were. Lord, it's even in moments when you don't know someone. That the virtue of who you are, the gospel, is always there and up front. Lord, for some sitting, standing here right now. Lord, he, he, and this is a great church. It's a great group of people. But Lord, just by the mere numbers, I know there's someone who has not invited someone else to church in forever. There's some, Lord, that has not spoken a word of truth to someone else about your love. They've not shared the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, for some, they've lived a life that they thought the preacher was the only one supposed to share the good news of Jesus Christ in a church setting. That's not the truth, God. So I ask you in this moment to help change their thought patterns, to change their way to see the blessings of God that they're missing out upon and to realize that there are people who are going to bump into them. And as Paul wrote in Ephesians Chapter Lord, uh, chapter one, Lord, it, it reads, ever since I first heard of your strong faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and your love for God's people everywhere, I have not stopped thanking God for you. I pray constantly for you, asking God, the glorious father of our Lord Jesus Christ, to give you spiritual wisdom. Lord, give us spiritual wisdom. And insight so that you might grow in your knowledge of God. Lord, help each and every one of us to realize we have not become who we can be. There's still more left ahead. Lord, I pray that all of our hearts will be flooded with light so that we can understand the confident hope 
that Jesus Christ has given to those he called the holy people who are his rich and glorious inheritance. Lord, I also pray that you will help us to understand the incredible greatness of your power, your virtue for us who believe in you. Lord, this is the same mighty power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at your right hand in the heavenly realms. Lord, I pray for that person this morning who is sad to find your joy. Lord, I pray for that person this morning who may feel bitter or broken to find forgiveness and love. Lord, I pray for that one who feels all alone to know that they have a family surrounding them. Lord, I pray for those who are going down the wrong path, following the wrong people, doing the wrong things. Lord, that they would find the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ in and through their life. And Lord, for those who are not, a, not, not ashamed, but Lord, scared to speak up about the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news to someone else in their life. Lord, I pray that you would help them to be able to share that. For Lord, the others, I pray, Lord, that we would just continually fan into flame the truth of your word and the power and the virtue of that. So when others bump into us, your love comes out of us and they see a better way. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.